Hey church, really good to be with you this morning and so sorry that we can't kind of gather together in, in person. Like this is just so bizarre a world we live in that we're having a third lockdown. You know, it's just unprecedented in our history that we find ourselves where we are. But there is hope, there is light. Um, and I'm not just talking about the vaccine, although I am. Really what I'm talking about most um, of all though is, is Jesus. Jesus is the light that shines in the darkness and the darkness is just blasted to obliteration. And you know, whilst life is often hard and COVID is, you know, a particularly um, acute example of that, like Jesus is always the hope. He's always the light. He's always with us. And this is a season, you know, particularly, and uh, you know, I'm going to speak a bit about this later actually, where, where I think, you know, if we create the space to set our hearts on him, even in the midst of anxiety and turmoil and difficulty, we can find peace and rest and joy because our peace, our rest, our joy are not found in our circumstances, which go up and go down. They are found in him, the one who is true, the one who is constant, the one who is God, the one who is with us, the one who loves us. So let's keep looking to Jesus. As we come to worship in a minute, let's keep looking to Jesus. So we are in the midst of strange times, but we're really excited because very soon we are going to be launching Alpha. Check out this video. Every day we ask so many questions. What should I wear? What's the weather going to be like? How am I going to fit everything in? But then there are those bigger questions, like why am I here? Where am I heading? Is there more to life than this? I had arrived at an answer to the most important issue that we humans ever deal with. Is there a God? And I had arrived there without ever really looking at the evidence. And I was supposed to be a scientist. At 28, uh, I had gotten many of the things that I thought I wanted. My girlfriend was on the cover of magazines, I had a Beamer, and I was so unhappy. It was a realization maybe that I would, I would never find happiness where I was looking for it. I think for so many years, you know, I always just strived to be strong in myself. All I needed was me and my buddies and, you know, would be like invincible, but the truth is none of us are. I found purpose, I found meaning, I found hope. God took something so broken and made it a beautiful art piece. Alpha is a place where you can be yourself, you can say what you think and challenge everything. No, no question is too complex or too simple. And what your point of view is, is as important as anyone else's. We are going on a journey together, an adventure to explore the questions of life, faith and meaning. Alpha, for those of you who don't know and didn't sort of um, haven't picked up, is is basically a kind of 11-week course, uh, an opportunity to engage with the Christian faith in a non-threatening kind of open environment where your quest you can just ask your questions, share your thoughts, and just wrestle with what you think those big questions of life together with other kind of people. And we would love it if, if we could just invite our friends to join 
us on Alpha. If we could invite those who we know maybe have those questions and don't get the opportunity to think about them, we invite those who don't know Jesus to, 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 to kind of consider him. Each week we watch a video um, and then we just have an open time of discussion. The idea is the video is kind of where um, we get to tell people what we think and the discussion is an opportunity for people to say what they think. So this isn't a kind of time where we basically, you know, get people and say, oh, this is what you really should believe. It's an open, free, informal kind of environment where people can genuinely wrestle with the big questions of life, thinking about the Christian faith. We would love you to invite your friends to join us. You know, it could be as simple as just sending them a text or a quick email, you know, linking them to our website, showing them the trailer, just saying, oh, saw this, wondered if you might be interested. And uh, people can either come by themselves or they, you could join them, whether for the first couple of weeks or for the whole thing. But we would love to absolutely fill out our alpha. Alpha this year is online, which means anyone can be invited. Doesn't matter where they are in the world, in the country, whether they're you know, a child of yours that's moved to London or Scotland, they can still join in. And what better a time to invite people to do Alpha than in a lockdown? No one's busy because everyone's got to stay in. And so why don't we invite our friends, invite our colleagues, invite those around us to come and join in with this to just wrestle with these big questions and to kind of see where it goes. If there's ever been a time where people are looking for hope, questioning, looking for answers, it's now. And Alpha is an amazing tool to enable us to do this as the church. It's an amazing way which we can bring hope to the lives of many because we can share with them how incredible Jesus is. So let's be praying for who we might invite and let's be inviting them and see what happens with Alpha. We're going to um, come to worship now. And I just want us to just take a moment to just prepare our hearts to worship him. Let's just quieten ourselves before the Lord. Just take a moment to just get yourself comfortable. Maybe you've just come in on a bustle this morning, you got out of the shower a bit late or, or whatever. Just take a moment to just settle yourself. Get comfortable where you are and just rest. And in that place, in that posture of rest, I just invite you to just lift up those things that are just weighing on your mind, whether they're pains, hurts, worries, you know, things that are causing you shame, anxiety. Just lift them up to God now. Just lift your eyes to him. We've come to worship. And worship is this great gift where we get to realign ourselves with the Lord. He is with you right now, wherever you are. And as we sing to him in praise, it helps us see him. It helps us meet with him because we are fixing our eyes on him. And so let's just now, as we come to praise and worship him in song, Use that as a vehicle to just fix our eyes on Jesus, to worship him, to enter into his presence and give him the glory that he is due this morning. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King, his love endures forever. All oh, is good, he is above all things, his love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise. In the mighty hands and an outstretched arm, his love endures forever. All the life that's been reborn, his love
His love endures forever And by the grace of God we will carry on His love endures forever Sing praise Sing praise Sing praise Sing Let's move on to our time of confession together. Just invite you to take stock of the past week. And this time of confession isn't one where we just trawl through our past guilt, but it's a way of stepping into the life that Jesus has bought for us today. Repentance simply means turning around. So as we confess the things that we've thought, said and done that we know we shouldn't have, let us also confess the truth that God delights in showing mercy. He's gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. So in the next few moments, just allow God to bring things up. 
and when he does, make the decision to turn from them and into all that God has. And let's say together the words that are on the screen. Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we've sinned in thought, word and deed. We've not loved you with our whole heart. We've not loved our neighbours as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. So we're here again in a new lockdown and whilst there seems to be a, a kind of glimmer of hope in the future with the vaccine rollout, you know, there does seem to be like ever increasing difficulty and things seem to be worse than they ever have been. And like, I look at that and I think, gosh, has there ever been a time where we have needed a move of God in power, you know, in recent memory? Don't we just long for God to move in power and to bring transformation to this nation? To bring transformation to lives, to bring people to him. And so often, I don't know if you, you share this, but I, I look at the, the picture of the church that we see in, for example, Acts, that we see you know, Jesus give us, and it's this church that moves in power. We see the disciples moving in power. We see people coming to know God in great number. We see lives being totally transformed. We see people who are a complete mess suddenly becoming these like pillars of strength in the church. We see someone like Paul, who is a total, you know, murderer. Like, you know, someone who's going around persecuting people and he turns out to be the greatest evangelist and Jesus kind of follower that, you know, we've seen. And, and it's all happened because there seems to be this power that the church has. But I look around in, in, you know, in the West today and I feel like, gosh, where's that power gone? We're not seeing very many people come to know Jesus. We're not seeing that kind of level of transformation. We're not seeing the kingdom come in the way that I think we long for and we hope for. And so, so often I think what we do is we, we buy into the kind of secular, materialistic, naturalistic life script that basically says kind of, this is all there is. You know, the only things there are are that which we can kind of touch and understand and see. And we kind of reduce our expectations for God to move in power in our nation. But we need a move of the Lord again afresh in power to change this nation, to bring revival, to bring renewal of all things, of all society, of lives, of structures, the whole bang shoot. We need God to move. And God has, and Jesus has always sort of said, well, actually, the way I, the way I want to move in, in my world is through my people, is through my church. And we want again to become a church of power. About eight years ago, I was working as a student pastor at a church in Southampton, and um, I felt really strongly um, God uh, speak to me. And um, I don't know if you've heard of Magaluf. Magaluf is a, uh, a sort of town, it's a clubbing resort really, on the Spanish island of Mallorca. And every year, thousands upon thousands of young people from Britain go out there on holiday to get drunk and, you know, have a massive blowout. And you get, you know, people sort of getting so drunk they jump from one balcony to another and plummet to their deaths. It, like, it, the stories that come out of there are genuinely heartbreaking. And I remember watching this programme on Magaluf on the telly and my heart was just gripped. And it was like God was saying, Will, you need to go to the people who are in Magaluf. You need to go and minister to them. And so I got together with my friend Nathan, who's uh, always a good person to kind of like get excited with. And we both started chatting and praying and feeling like, I really feel like God's telling us to go here. But I've no idea what to do. And before we knew it, because it's kind of our personality, we both talked one another into doing this. And, um, you know, we had 
12 people, 12 students booked flights, ready to go, coming to Magaluf. And we flew out and we prayed and we worshipped in advance and spent a lot of time seeking the Lord. And I remember arriving there thinking, I have absolutely no idea what we're here to do. I have no idea how we're going to do it. I, I don't really even know where to start. I just felt utterly, utterly clueless. And I was putting on a brave face, a bit of bravado to Nathan, a bit of bravado to the group, because I didn't want them to think we didn't have a clue. We just led them out here. But I had no idea. But we just sought the Lord. There was this just, um, I don't know, just all of us, there was just this desperation because we didn't know what we were doing. We sought God. We sought his presence. We, there was a, a spirit of dependency. You know, every time when we went out to minister on the streets, we had people praying. You know, earlier in the day, we spent time each day, like ages in prayer and worship. And, you know, the presence of God was tangible in those moments in ways that I've, I've rarely experienced. Like, you know, lives of the group were transformed. We had people who were very insecure at the beginning of the trip. God did something in their lives and they came away confident. You know, we had so many amazing stories of what God did in our life as a group as we prayed, as we worshipped, as we sought him. And, and, and we didn't have a clue what we were doing, but we went out and we started just fumbling around in groups of three and ended up in conversations with people and praying with them and ministering to them. And the stories we had were just incredible. You know, Magaluf is an awful place. I really don't say that with any um, holding back. You walk down the main strip and it smells of vomit. Like, I'm not even joking. The whole place smells of vomit. It's awful. And there's people swarming everywhere, you know, various different states of drunkenness. And there's these reps who are quite pushy and try and pull you into clubs. Um, but there's not just clubs there. There's like loads and loads of strip clubs and brothels. And I've never before in my life had seen someone who was a rep for a brothel. You know, someone literally come up to me and, and, and try and kind of like give me a good deal and pull me in uh, to this brothel uh, uh, where there's Eastern European women who have been trafficked. It's horrendous. It's really horrific. But we just sought God and continually we found him lead us into places. We felt like God say, go down this street and we'd end up bumping into this group of people and having this ridiculously amazing conversation. I remember this one group we bumped into, we started chatting to it, it turned out their friend had died, the, you know, just a few weeks previous, and we were able to pray with them and minister to them. You know, we spoke prophetic words into people's lives that had an accuracy that you couldn't make up or have by chance. People were convicted that, the, that God was with them, that something was happening. You know, the most amazing thing was there's these, uh, so we, we've got women who are trapped in prostitution who work in the brothels. But there's also a load of women from West Africa who've come over and sort of to try and sort of provide for their families and, and ended up falling into prostitution and are now trapped. And they are hated. They kind of walk and prowl the streets and they kind of lurk in sort of corners and, and they're known for basically robbing people and uh, taking advantage of drunken people and holding them at knife point. And they're hated by everyone who lives there. And we were told in uncertain terms, don't have anything to do with them. Don't go near them. They're dangerous. You mustn't speak to them. And one of our group, um, Emily, just really felt like God laying on her heart, you know, for these people, for these women. And so we started to chat to these women, get to know them. Before we knew it, we had this, and I, I, I look back and I am baffled this even happened, but we had this nightly Bible study in the middle of the street with these like West African women who were trapped in prostitution, like every evening. You know, I remember one evening we were stood there outside one of the biggest clubs in Europe. There's like loads of people milling around, people being sick, people drunken, people singing. Um, there's women pole dancing, scantily clad, like meters away from me. And we're stood there with this group of about 12 women studying the gospel of John and singing Amazing Grace. It was like the kingdom has come. Like God is moving in power. This is incredible. And we went home buzzing. The next year came and um, we were like, oh, we've got to go back. That was so good. We've got to go back. And so we you know, got another group. It was a bigger group because last year was so good. More people wanted to join in. And we went out and, you know, um, and we did many of the same things. And, but it, it didn't seem to like, we didn't have the same stories. We tried to sort of gather these women who worked on the street, but it just didn't seem to happen. They didn't seem to want to know. It, we, we weren't seemingly doing anything different. We were doing good stuff and there was some good stories and there were some in conversations that felt vaguely hopeful, but it felt like the whole thing lacked 
power. And I remember coming away feeling just a bit jaded. Gone out with such hope off the back of last year and, and yet that seemed to fade. And I think so often we feel like that in the church. We look back at a previous you know, time, whether it's 50 years ago, or whether we look back to the book of Acts, or whether we look back to some of the great revivals that have happened in this nation. You know, the, the, the Hebridean revival in Scotland, the Welsh revival, you know, where just unbelievable things happened. God came in power, lives were transformed, people came to the, to the Lord in unprecedented number. And we look back on those things and we think, gosh, why aren't we seeing that anymore? Why is it that we seem to lack power in the church today? I want to look at the book of um, Ezekiel, which is um, a, a, an amazing book. It's a bit crazy at times, but Ezekiel is a prophet who's writing to the people of Israel in a time when they're in exile, where everything's kind of gone to pot, where the, it, it seems that everything's lost. They're trapped. They lack power. It seems hopeless. And God speaks to them through Ezekiel. We're looking in Ezekiel 36, and I'm going to read from verse 22. Therefore say to the Israelites, this is what the sovereign Lord says. It's not for your sake, people of Israel, that I'm going to do these things, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you have gone. I will show the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, the name which you have profaned among them, Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Sovereign Lord, when I am proved holy through you before their eyes. For I will take you out of the nations, I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Then you will live in the land I gave your ancestors. You'll be my people and I'll be your God. I will save you from all your uncleanness. I will call for the corn and make it plentiful and will not bring famine upon you. It will increase I will increase the fruit of the trees and the crops of the fields so that you will no longer suffer disgrace among the nations because of famine. Then you will remember your evil ways and wicked deeds. You will loathe yourself for your sins and detestable practices. I want you to know that I am not doing this for your sake, declares the Sovereign Lord. Be ashamed and disgraced for your conduct, people of Israel. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. On that day, I will cleanse you from all your sins. I will resettle your towns and the ruins will be rebuilt. The desolate land will be cultivated instead of lying desolate in the sight of all who pass through it. They will say the land that was laid waste has become like the Garden of Eden. The cities that were lying in ruins, desolate and destroyed, are now fortified and inhabited. Then the nations around you that remain will know that I, the Lord, have rebuilt that which was destroyed and have replanted that which was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken this and I will do it. Isn't that what we want to see, guys? Don't we just want to see the renewal of this world? Don't we just want to see society renewed and brought to what it should be? Don't we want to see that kind of Edenic reality kind of re-realised, where everything's brought back into that right relationship with God, where there is no more suffering, where there is no more war, where there is peace, where there is no inequality? Don't we just want to see a society where love is the kind of like centre of all we are? Don't we want to see this kind of place, you know, cities that were lying in ruins, lying desolate, come back to the fullness of life? Don't we want to see that which is hopeless become hopeful? Don't we want to see that which is desperate and joyless and seems pitiful become joyful and full of hope and and a story of of the presence of God turning up. That's what we want to see. We want to see the reality of this promise that God makes to his people in the book of Ezekiel. What does he say? He says this. First of all, he says, I will show the holiness of my great name. Like, for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you have gone, I will show the holiness of my great name. Like God is wanting to show his holiness through his people. And he still wants to do that today through his church. 
He wants to show how awesome he is, how amazing he is, such that we might all trust in him and all be renewed by him and step into the kingdom that he is building and pushing forward. How does he do that? How does he turn his people into this symbol of holiness that becomes a sign of renewal that draws people in? How does he restore power to his people? It says that I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from your impurities and from all your idols. You know, God will change our our ways of thinking, our, our, our value systems. He will do it. We can't do it. He will do it. I will. You know, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. He will do it. The promise that God is giving in Ezekiel, the truth that I think God wants us to hear today, Redland Church, is this. It's that the power of God comes with the presence of God. The power of God comes with the presence of God. If we are to be a people of power, we need to be a people of his presence. Because it's about what he does in and through us that's powerful, not first and foremost about what we do. You see, I look back on Magaluf and I look back on year one and I look back on year two and you know I realised what happened. Year one, we didn't have a clue what we were doing. And so we came in to you know, seek God in desperation. We needed him. We saw his presence. He was at the centre of everything we did. Like we couldn't walk around a corner without praying because frankly it was A, dangerous and B, we didn't have a clue what we were up to. We needed him to guide us. We needed him to show us the way. Year two, you know what happened? We knew what we were doing. We'd done it before. You know, we didn't even, and I really regret this, we didn't ask God whether he wanted us to go again. We went year one because he led us. Year two, we went because last year was good. Not because God was telling us to go. And I'm not sure he was, if I'm totally honest with you. I'm not sure he was telling us to go. But we went anyway and we knew what we were doing. And so it wasn't that we didn't seek him. It wasn't that we kind of like, you know, became apostates and just disregarded the Lord and just did our own thing. It's never that black and white. What happened is the presence of God got pushed to the peripheries. And when the presence of God gets pushed to the periphery, the power of God gets pushed to the periphery. And we end up with a human-driven renewal movement. And human-driven renewal movements, look around the world, don't go anywhere. Look at every single endeavour around the world right now that is trying to bring something of the kind of kingdom values to bear on this world. They are all failing. And where they are succeeding, they are succeeding at the cost of kind of bitterness, guilt, shame. Like, that's what happens when the presence of God gets pushed to the periphery. The power of God gets pushed to the periphery. And we end up with a human-driven movement that gets us nowhere. We need his presence and we need his power. This is the story of the entirety of the scriptures. You know, in time and time again, we see in the scriptures... God comes to be present with his people. We see renewal, we see life, we see flourishing, we see people, you know, being transformed. What happens over time is, is, is it, it's rarely actually, and this is interesting, it's rarely that people like totally disregard the Lord. Often what happens to the people of Israel in the scriptures is the presence of God just gets pushed to the peripheries. Marduk gets a look in, Baal, well, we'll try him for a while. You know, all the Canaanites, what they're doing looks interesting. Let's try that out. You know, it, it, it's that compromise sleeps in that that you know the presence of God it just it doesn't go from people's lives but it becomes less central it becomes less central and you know I wonder have we become a powerless church And if we have become a powerless church, have we become a powerless church because the presence of God has become less central? It's not that we've totally disregarded it. It's just that he's been pushed to the peripheries. We know what we're doing. You know, we carry on doing the same things that we've always done because they're good and we like them and they seem to make sense to us. But have we checked with God that he still wants to do them? 
You know, how, uh, do we seek him like in contending prayer with a sense of desperation that says we have no clue. We don't know what we're doing. We need you. Or, or is it kind of we just chuck up a bit of a prayer at the beginning of the meeting and then get on with, you know, our clever work of, of doing what we do because we know what we're doing. Is there a danger that we've become a powerless church because we've allowed the presence of God to go to the peripheries? He's not central to our lives in the same way. You see, and I think this is the core truth that I think, if I'm honest, I think has got to be central to our vision and mission as a church going forward. I think this has almost in some ways got to be the touchstone of what we're about. Our doing for God is only as effective as our being with God. If our doing for God does not flow from a being with God, we will have nothing to offer the world because the only thing we have to offer the world is Christ in us. But we can't do Christ in us. He's got to do it in us. And so we need to be out there. We need to be, you know, like campaigning for justice. We need to be, you know, uh, caring about the creation as well. We need to be sharing the good news of Jesus. But if we're not starting with a, 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 a like commitment to seek him above all else if that's not the cornerstone of everything that we're about if that's an afterthought if that's a peripheral thing to all the other activity everything we do will be powerless will be ineffective and will ultimately be pointless and hopeless and will just lead if i'm honest to exhaustion and tiredness and weariness and we will not be offering the world something that it needs we'll be offering it a mirror of what it already is Because the only thing that will bring renewal to this world is Christ in us, the hope of glory. The only way that we will offer the world Christ in us, the hope of glory, is if we become a people who centre our entire lives as a body and as individuals around him, around his presence, around seeking him. You know, do we in our lives at the moment have a rhythm that centres us on Jesus? You know, or, or are we kind of just skimming? You know, I find myself so often just skimming, like tipping into kind of what I would like to call a kind of tick box Christianity. You know, we kind of, we go to church on Sunday, tick, great, done that, crack on with the week. You know, we, we start in the morning, you know, by reading our Bible and praying a bit and it's like, I've got that out of the way, crack on with the day. You know, it's almost like we're getting God out of the way such that we, because we kind of feel we need to do that such that we can get on with everything else. And I, I find myself convicted at the beginning of this year and I wonder if God is inviting us as a church to something new. That instead of kind of checking with God at the beginning of the day and then kind of continuing the rest of the day in almost blissful ignorance of him, I wonder whether God might be inviting us to become once again a people of his presence and in doing so become a people of power. But by, by centering our day on him, but by him being the cornerstone of our day, by him being something that we're not trying to get out of the way to get on with the other stuff, but in fact the opposite. You know, that we're, we're, we're finding ways throughout our day to look back to Jesus, to centre ourselves on the only one who can enable us and empower us to, to, to be a thing of blessing in this world. You know, in your job, you can be a blessing in and through your job. Jesus has created you to be a blessing in and through your job. You know, he's created you to do amazing things in your job and to create things and to make things and to, to build things and to, to better this world. But we're only going to be able to be truly effective in that if Jesus is at the heart of it. We're only going to be able to have Jesus at the heart of it if we keep looking to him. You know, maybe, maybe there's an invitation today to just carve out a bit more time to just look to him during your working day. Maybe that's a kind of like a simple thing. Maybe that's a little reminder that comes on your phone every hour just to just remind yourself to look to Jesus. Maybe in your lunch break, that's cutting out five minutes just to, to spend a bit of time in his presence. Read a psalm, look to him, refocus your gaze on the one who you need. Because what this world needs is Christ in us, the hope of glory. It does not need us. It needs him in us. We need to be doing But unless our doing flows from our being with God, it will ultimately be empty and powerless. Church, I wonder at the beginning of 2021, in the midst of chaos and bedlam and all sorts of strange things, maybe in this time of lockdown, could this be the moment where God is inviting you right now to make a change? 
to change your life from being one where the presence of God is an afterthought and something at the peripheries to being something where it's at the very centre, where you've strategically and intentionally structured your day and diaried in time so you can look to him as the priority before everything else, such that we might be a people of his presence, such that we might become a people of his power, a holy people who shine brightly to the world and offer them a vision of what could be, offer them a vision of renewal, offer them a vision ultimately of the kingdom of God made present on earth through his people. I wonder if he might be inviting you to make that change today. Should we pray? Oh Jesus, we need you. We need you above all else and we're so sorry for the ways in which we've pushed you to the peripheries, for the way you've become an afterthought, a tick box. And we want you to be the centre of everything, but we're so mindful, Lord, that there's so many things vying for our attention. We're, we're so kind of stuck in patterns of doing and being that, that, that changing that is really hard. And we need you to guide us. We need you to lead us. And so I pray right now that you will show us what change we might make, what little step we might take to just begin that little bit more to centre our lives and our days on you. We love you, Jesus. We praise you. Guide us, I pray. Amen. Well, we've come to the point in our service today where we pray together. So before we pray, let's spend a moment and just gather our scattered senses around the presence of God. And we pray, come, Holy Spirit, would you teach us to pray? We thank you, Lord, for that promise that you made centuries ago that you will give your people a new heart and give them a new spirit, that you will remove from them a heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. And generations later, Lord, we ask you to do the same with us. Would you renew our hearts? We pray, Lord, that we might see the work of your renewal across the earth, across this world that so desperately needs you. Father, we ask that especially for America at this time. Lord, we saw some disturbing images this week of what happened, what's been happening there. We pray, Lord, that you would do your work of renewal there. Lord, where there's been unrest and contention and division, we pray, Lord, for your peace and your unity. And Lord, you call your people to pray for leaders. And so, Lord, we pray for the leaders of that country. We pray for Joe Biden coming in. And we pray for Donald Trump going out. And we pray, Lord, for a smooth transition. And so, too, we pray for the leaders of our nation. We pray for Boris Johnson and the government. We pray for the scientific leaders who are, who are guiding and make, helping to make decisions. Pray for our MPs. Father, we lift them before you and pray that you would send your spirit on them. Pray that you would anoint them to govern as you govern. That they would govern with your will. And Lord, now we bring before you leaders in, our, in the spheres that we're involved with. Whether that's our schools, or our workplaces, our line managers, our teachers. We bring them before you now. Lord, we know that these are uncertain and difficult times and we pray for creative solutions in each of the spheres that we're involved with. We pray, Lord, that your kingdom would come and your will would be done. And more specifically for this lockdown that we're all in now, we, we pray for different areas. Firstly, for the schools and the place of education. We lift the ones that we know before you now. The schools in our areas that we walk by or think of, we, we bring them before you. Pray, Lord, for grace for teachers providing online content and grace for parents and carers who are having to juggle being parents and working and, and all sorts. And we pray, Lord, that you would give them all that they need. Pray across this nation that education won't be negatively impacted. Pray for students and children who are, are feeling worried and uncertain and we pray for your grace for them. 
And secondly, we pray for businesses and jobs. And we bring before you, Lord, our own jobs and businesses and people we know in those situations. We pray for comfort and for assurance of your presence. Father, we pray that you would protect jobs in this time and protect businesses. Pray that there be creative solutions in this difficult time. And thirdly, Lord, we bring before you people who are grieving or feeling particularly isolated and anxious. Lord, we thank you for your promise to be our comfort. And we pray for people we know that uh, in those in those difficult times, we pray, Lord, that you would be their light and their salvation, their comfort and their joy. For all those we know that have lost loved ones, would you show them your peace? Let's pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to say. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
Jesus, thank you for our time together today. And I just really pray that you'll guide us and lead us and help us to just, you know, build our lives around you, build our lives around your presence. I pray as we kind of, you know, go from this place today, Lord, that you just might be speaking to us, that things might be kind of coming to mind of, you know, patterns, rhythms that we can put in our lives to help us fix our eyes continually on you. Be with us, I pray, particularly in this time of difficulty where hope seems scant. Lord, remind us that you are our hope, I pray. Amen. So good to have you with us. Do please join us for our kind of post-church Zoom. You should have got the link in the email. Um, we would love to just have an opportunity to connect to one another. Um, you know, and, and in that post-church Zoom, let's be praying for one another. Let's um, share with one another. If we're finding things difficult, let's, let's ask for prayer. But we would love every single one of you to jump on Zoom right now and to just have an opportunity to chat with one another. Um, and that'll be starting in just a moment. Um, so, so do log on and join us for that. But I hope you have a good week. Um, let's be praying for one another. Let's be encouraging one another um, and reminding one another that Jesus is with us. See you later. <laughs>